Coming up on this week's show, we talk to Scott Pomfret about his four new books. Laura Bombach is here as part of the 2016 GRL blog tour. Plus, we've got books for authors and a couple movies to discuss. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome to episode 40 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamsrides.com. And I'm Will from willknaus.com. How are you doing this fine day? I'm okay. That's good. Is my, uh, well, now it isn't. I tried to have a, a lower butcher register <laughs> in my intro read. How did it, how did, how did it feel to you? I thought it felt pretty good. Okay. But, uh, I like your reads in general, so, you know. <laughs> I don't. I rarely listen back to what we record because it's, um, it's unappealing to my ear, but that's just me. I'm sorry. Oh, well, what are you going to do? I listen to the playback a lot while yeah. I put it together, and it all sounds fine to me. Yes, you do. So. And you are a, a better man than I. <laughs> um, so you have got uh, some news, some writing-related topics of discussion. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, so I was, I'm still working on revisions for the... Somewhere on Mackinac story, mm -hmm. and those are going pretty well. You've got the first half of that story, actually. Uh, back to you to read and see how the revisions turned out. And I've been filling out forms like crazy this week for Love's Opening Night. Blurb forms, cover forms, production data forms. It's been form central. Fancy. This week, indeed. <laughs> um, also read some author books this week. Well, we both did some author-related books. Uh, two books have come out within the last week or so. Uh, Successful Author Mindset by Joanna Penn. And How to Write a Sizzling Synopsis by Brian Cohen. Mm -hmm. uh, I found both of these to be exceedingly helpful and beneficial. Um, Successful Author Mindset is, is a great follow-up from Joanna to her uh, author entrepreneur book that came out uh, late 2014. Uh, it really breaks down individual scenarios where authors can get kind of caught up in their own head from writer's block to comparison itis to I don't know how to manage my time between the day job and trying to write I don't know how to deal with my friends who say that this is really just a hobby or how everybody thinks they can write a book or I, I'd say there's easily 20 to 30 scenarios in this book that just really lay out in some nice chunks there's a section about the writing process in general, another section as you prepare to publish and have published, and kind of a third section for like your overall career mindset. And it was set up really well. And I thought Joanna really kind of laid herself out on the page too very often because she would bring out excerpts from her journal. She's, she's a very heavy journaler, uh, as we found out listening to her podcast. And she put stuff on the page that I don't know that I would have the guts to put out. Uh, how I was feeling in any given moment coming off of, like, I think she had one in there that was from a Thriller Fest visit and how she felt coming away from that and how all these other people seemed to be doing better than her and how it made her feel in the aftermath. And then, you know, she gives the antidote for how you bring yourself back from that kind of thing. So I, I thought this was a really good book. I could see it, you know, it's in my tablet, so the tab it's as close as my tablet if I ever just need to pick it up and kind of have a, a sit-down moment with it. And it kind of reorient my brain at any given moment. Mm -hmm. What did you think of it? Because you read it also. I did read it as well, and I I uh, am equally enthusiastic and highly recommend it to all of our author friends uh, and any authors who might be listening to this particular show. Um, you're right. There are some really candid and honest uh, excerpts from Joanna's own experience uh, as a fiction author. Um so not only is she kind of writing about it and uh, walking you through um, how you can deal with uh, certain, you know, emotions that come up uh, on your author journey, you know, she's, you know, she's been there as well. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, walking the walk, as they say. Yes. <laughs> um, also, I think it's... A, a very practical book as well. It's not just all, you know, woo-woo-woo. Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of 
uh, writing books or craft books that are all, you know, airy-fairy, write the book of your heart kind of... Uh, ugh. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't personally respond to that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, Joanna doesn't write that way. Um, she, like you said, she presents certain scenarios that you might experience from, uh, all the way from, you know, from a beginner author to someone who's several books into their career. Um, she goes through certain scenarios, talks through uh, some of the root causes and how you might, you know, reframe those kinds of situations. So I think it's all really smart practical stuff and the successful author mindset uh basically continues uh the thoughts ideas and concepts uh from her earlier nonfiction work mm -hmm. uh, i think there's sort of a, a continuing thread that follows uh through um, her mm -hmm. nonfiction books so. and I, I like the thread in this book too the mm -hmm. three sections flow together very nicely so whether you're having an immediate problem and you want to jump straight to a chapter, you can do that. Or it's a good book just to read yeah. the first time out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other one that came out this week was How to Write a Sizzling Synopsis by Brian Cohen. Uh, I've used Brian's uh, description service on my Flipping for Him book, and I ended up with a much better part of description, or blurb, as one might call it, uh, that I had before, because he's really an ace copywriter. And in this book... He breaks down the synopsis, which is, in in his view, a, a, a small part of your overall blurb or part of description. Uh, he tells you what to put in it, what to leave out of it, and really why you're doing each thing so that you get the synopsis that works the best for your book. So you're not trying to put in everything in the kitchen sink. You're getting very succinct into what will sell that book, regardless of your genre. Uh, and it was very helpful as I was filling out those forms that I mentioned earlier because they wanted synopsises in there. Mm -hmm. And I had to provide those. And suddenly I had the book to help me write it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, this one, too, just needs to be, you know, on the author's bookshelf. So when they write that synopsis that we all dread, they could pull that book down, have a little brush up, and write their synopsis probably in a much more in a much better mindset than they were before because there's not as much to dread after you read this book. Yes, um, exactly. This particular book uh, is short, it's concise, it's to the point. It gives you um, all the information uh, exactly as you need it. Um, what's most important is Brian uh, gets across in a you know non-sleazy way how to make the synopsis or blurb or product description or uh, however, whatever you want to call it. Um, he makes sure that it's doing the work that it needs to do. Mm -hmm. Because your synopsis slash product description isn't necessarily what your book is about. It is a marketing tool. It is meant to pull readers in. So he focuses primarily, uh, for the most part, on your characters, because that's what readers are going to latch on to. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to say, oh, that's interesting. They don't care if, you know, it's a warm summer day and your character goes for a walk and, oh, no, uh, they're kidnapped. Or, oh, no, look up in the sky, there's an asteroid falling. Um, that sort of plot point or story beat way of... Uh, writing your synopsis um, generally doesn't connect with people. Yeah, it's all about the, it's, it's all about what the guy with the movie voice would say in the trailer. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's really about characters and understanding what is most marketable uh, and appealing to your readers. Yeah. So uh, both of us highly recommend Brian's book. You should really, really check it out. Yeah, there are links to both Brian and Joanna's book in the show notes, as well as to the reviews that I wrote on jeffadams.com. Yeah. No, sorry, jeffadamswrites.com. Let's uh, just brand that correctly. Get it right. Get it right. <laughs> um, and in, in celebration, I guess, of these two books, um, <laughs> the GRL blog tour giveaway word of the week for this week is Mindset. So plug that into the raffle copter. We'll talk about the giveaway a little bit later in the show, but that's the word of the week. It's mindset. Mm. Time now for the GRL Guest Author Spotlight. 
We're happy to welcome Laura Bombach to the podcast as part of the official 2016 GRL blog tour. Recognized in 2010 by Rolling Stone magazine as a pioneer of the MM romance genre, Laura is the multi-award winning acclaimed author of short stories, novels, and screenplays. She's busy writing her newest novel, tentatively titled The Dark Side, a new series featuring ex-Special Forces turned security specialist Reese Holt. Laura devotes herself full-time to publishing and writing. She's the founder of the only RWA chapter for GLBT romance authors called the Rainbow Romance Writers. She is also the owner of Man Love Romance Press, commonly known as MLR Press, a small publishing house that specializes in gay erotic romance, mystery, and fiction. Thanks for being with us, Laura. Well, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. So how long have you been writing in this category of romance? Well, actually, I've been writing uh, in probably a little over 15 years now. I kind of uh, got into it from a roundabout way through uh, slash fan fiction and doing some uh, consulting on a script uh, for some filmmakers, a B film, uh, maybe C, <laughs> in California uh, because I, I am an emergency trauma nurse as well and I did some medical consulting on their script wrote some fan fiction to go along with the vampire film that they were making. And uh, they came to me and asked if they could publish my collection of fan fiction when the film was released, uh, which I was honored and thrilled and whatnot <laughs> to have them do. And then it was such a hit and actually won an award, I can't believe that, for fan fiction, outside of the fan fiction world. And uh, the distributor came back and asked if they could convince me to write some original fiction. And my career was born. <laughs> nice. That, that's very cool. Uh, we hear a lot, you know, from authors who get their start in Slash. And that's an amazing way to do it. Kind of a, a authorized Slash, if you will. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, very much so. And, and it, it, was, it was a terrific way to learn how to write. I can remember the, mm, I'd been writing a particular piece of fan fiction a series for quite some time and I finally had someone write me and said geez who does your beta work for you and I wrote back and said beta what's a beta <laughs> and she said I thought so she actually turned out to be an editor of a newspaper in Washington so she was really quite highly skilled and uh, she taught me a lot a lot and it was it was quite a quite a learning experience all of the fan fiction which was great what are some of the key changes you've seen over 15 years because you you certainly got some uh, some time in this genre. Oh my gosh, the entire process is is taking a you know a, a complete turnaround. When I started officially writing uh, original uh, male male erotic romance, it, it was impossible, and I do mean this in the word phrase impossible to get anyone in the romance community to review it. I was denied, denied, denied. Uh, there were only a couple publishers who would actually, and these were ebook. Uh, publishers who would actually put uh, accept the the uh, stories, which which they did of mine, and I had to beg, whine, and cry to have them put the books into print because you couldn't really qualify for anything within the romance, the official romance community, unless you were in print at that time. And everybody was very, very reluctant. They kept saying there wasn't a big enough market, there wasn't a big enough market, but they didn't understand that their market is not only a GBLT who people who might want to, community that might want to read the books, but there is a huge community of straight women who enjoyed uh, th this particular category of romance. And it was, a, it was a hard time to convince them that that was occurring. So we, when I first started, uh, talk about being the black sheep, it was, I was uh, dissed at conventions. I actually had all of my promotional material removed at one convention because it offended another guest at the hotel. Uh, there was just it was an uphill battle with every single book that I that I wrote to get it to where it needed to be. So and nowadays, people who write kind of expect people to fawn all over them and to give them reviews and to get their books right out where they need them to be, but they don't understand that that those of us who started it. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, had a huge struggle ahead of us. I'm <laughs> pleased beyond words that it's no longer uh, that difficult, that it's become an accepted uh, genre within the romance community, the official romance community, as well as outside of that. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about your latest work, The Dark Side? Well, uh, I hadn't written for a number of years. Uh, after my last 
book, uh, Mexican Heat, which came out, which I wrote in, uh, co-wrote with another author, uh, Josh Langdon. Uh, it did very well. It 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 was it won us a, a whole room full of awards. Did its thing, but by then my the press uh, MLR press had started taking off to a to a bigger degree, and I decided I needed to devote more attention to publishing other people's work, and getting them out in print, getting them out there officially. That was the real reason I started the press was that so we could get our category of romance into print, so that it would be allowed to participate in some of the RWA uh, contests and events and whatnot under a le- legitimate title, and. Uh, I needed to devote more attention to that. So I hadn't written anything for quite some time. I wrote a short story last year only because my editor beat me. And <laughs> we, we had, we had, uh, we were doing a series and, and two people had, had to fall out at the last minute. And so she needed a pitch hitter. And so she turned to me and I broke down and I wrote a short story. And once I really got back into it, I, I realized how much I missed it. But I have to admit that I felt very um, unsure of getting back into it, how readers would receive it. Did I still have the ability to tell a decent story? Uh, it was it was a difficult decision to make to sit down and start, especially since I consider this to be a new series, a, a whole new world, create a whole new universe. So it, it, to prepare myself, I actually uh, broke down and I, I took the uh, James Patterson master class uh, for writing thrillers. This is a romantic suspense novel, which is, you know, pretty much the same same vein and uh, that helped a whole lot it, it helped build my confidence back up and let me realize that I still knew how to tell a good story uh, I still rely heavily on my editors to make me look like I could tell a good story uh, and uh, it's gone a lot smoother than I expected it to I, I was surprised to find myself feeling unsure after n- numerous stories titles um, books novels short stories screenplays but I did I, I felt a little unsure but I'm really glad that I got back to it. Is the book out now, or does it have a date? It does have a date. It will release at GRL just be prior to it. It's uh, coming out in October. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was, I've got the last few scenes to write this week, and hopefully it's off to the editor soon. I want to have the book available for some early reviewing and whatnot before the release date in October. So, uh, And the second book's already been plotted out, so that's a big achievement for for my poor little disused brain to uh, manage to organize yet. But uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm pretty excited about it. Tell us a little bit about Reese Holt and, and, and the kind of adventures really expect there. Well, actually, yeah, I was, I was, I should, probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I was heavily influenced, you know, uh, inspired, I should say, by the, um, uh, the TV show uh, Person of Interest. I love their main character. Uh, I think that that kind of a tough seasoned hurt hero is uh, is very endearing to me uh, and I kind of styled my guy a little bit based on that character uh, he was my inspiration you know they, it has to come from someplace so I, he really was um, the seed in my brain when I was creating this character uh, my, my, my mind kept going back to, the, to that character there and uh, I kind of fleshed it out, made it my own, of course. That's what you have to do with your, your own um, person because, uh, you know, you put so much of your own personality and your own, um, a piece of yourself goes into every character you create. And he, he wasn't uh, any different. But I, I like the flawed hero. Uh, you know, no one's perfect. And it's those flaws sometimes that not only make us interesting, but make us redeemable. And um, uh, it was quite a lot of fun to create such such an unemotional or restrained person because I definitely am not that that person and uh, after I started working on it it's surprisingly enough he just kind of took on a life of his own and I does it doesn't even feel like I was creating him after a while he just kind of blossomed into his own person as the story went on uh, so it, it fell into it quite naturally and I was very pleased it's one of the the few characters that has evolved so quickly and so spontaneously on his own. I think it must be all that seven years of not writing at all. It was kind of hiding in the back of my head and ready to explode and grow once I let him out of the cage there. And uh, He's a, a very stalwart, loyal, but a closed personality. And, you know, he lives to, he's got a bit of the white knight syndrome in him. And uh, it's very important for him to help 
save every little piece of the world that he runs across. Uh, but he's a hard guy to get to know and love because he is pretty closed off. So it takes a special person to be able to, to tolerate that on a daily basis. And then that's where the secondary character, of course, you know, comes in. And, and he also kind of grew organically and naturally. Uh, and uh, his name is Alex Thorne, Throne, excuse me. And uh, he, he developed pretty, pretty easily, fell into that, into that mold as someone who could tolerate and, and live with that other, that other type of personality. Uh, it, it was a, a challenge at times to write a, a romance, an erotic romance, actually, with someone who, who is, um, others maybe describe as emotionless, uh, but really isn't. Uh, so that was kind of a challenge, and, and uh, I was uh, I was actually enjoying that, you know, the subtleties of it, the the small cues that they have to give, and and the way the other person picks up on them. It, it was uh, it was a very challenging and and uh, exciting actually uh, interaction to write. I hope I pulled it off. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you went like full tilt for your for your return to the writing with all with the complex characters and everything and. Oh, I did. As a matter of fact, it, um, as I said, I was feeling very unsure of myself. I actually, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, since writing originally, I put a call out to a couple of, uh, of my uh, people and asked for someone to beta read for me. Uh, but I tried not to get anyone who liked my writing, but I did want them to... <laughs> It was short, small short story. The first person who beta read for me said, geez, I, I knew you owned the press, but I didn't realize you were an author, <laughs> which crushed my soul, of course. <laughs> but nonetheless, and, and that was good, though, because she didn't come in with any preconceived notions and, and expectations, nor did she really care whether or not I liked her opinion, which is exactly what I wanted and what, what I needed. And both of the betas who, who came in and volunteered to do it um, told me that it was an excellent story. So Great. that, that, that kind of supported myself because I've kept writing thinking, this is the first chapter. Do I really, should I continue or shouldn't I continue? Uh, you know, have I, have I really lost it? And, uh, with that little bit of reassurance, I decided to dive into it, but I knew that I really had to make it the best it could be not only for my readers who've been very, very, very loyal and waiting over these last few years for me to put out uh, another book. Uh, but I also, I needed not to embarrass myself, <laughs> and, and I wanted it to be the absolute best I could, it could be, uh, which is why I've gone to great pains to, to, to write and rewrite it and, and double check and took the master's class so that I remembered all the, all the high points and the things that I really I knew, but I've been rusty about using because I haven't been, been writing. And it was very important to me that this book come off and, and be a success. Uh, so, so it, it, it wasn't all that difficult to, to kind of give it its all. And I really, after 15 years, you know, every time you write, you write better than you wrote last the time before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you, and your craft grows and, and you, you know how to polish and you know where to look and, and you remember the fine points. And, and uh, little by little, those were the things that I thought that I had lost. But I feel fairly confident that I have... Uh, uh, they, they were just waiting in the back of my head for me to actually open the doors and, and let them back out again. So um, I'm pleased with it thus far, you know, although I will be a nervous wreck when the first review comes in. <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking forward to in Kansas City this year? Uh, reconnecting with uh, fans. Uh, you know, Kansas City is all about the fans being able to come and meet some of their authors. Uh, writing is is not a solitary process. Uh, the actual physical writing of, of the book is, yes. Uh, but everything else that is combined with, you know, writing is half the battle. The other half is, is marketing and letting people know it's out there because you can have the best book in the world, but if no one realizes that it's there, it's of no use to anybody, including you. And uh, so being able to have that moment where you can reconnect with, with the fans and other writers, uh, although you can spend as much time as you want on email and this and that, it is never the same as face-to-face -face, um, personal contact. The, those times make a, a huge difference in 
in your social interaction and, and the way you view things. Um, and it's your presentation while you're there. You know, it's important that your fans see you uh, as the person that you are or the person that you would like to present yourself to be to them. And it, it makes it far more memorable to to a fan when they're reading a book. Uh, I know I myself personally, when I have met a famous person, it and it, they made it and they made a good impression. Let me add that. Uh, it, it suddenly somehow you seem closer to them and you realize just how much you either do have in common with them or don't. And it can make a big difference on whether or not you, you continue to read their books or you continue to watch the movies that they're in and whatnot. So it's a very important time. And, and I'm looking forward to making that a success and hooking back up with people again that I haven't seen for a while. Excellent. Now, what's the best way for people to keep up with you online? Uh, there are a number of places. Uh, I am available at um, on um, Facebook, which is basically uh, facebook.com slash laura.bomba. Uh, you can also find my books at the press, which is www.mlrbooks.com. I have my own website, of course, which is www.laurabomba.com. And uh, you can also find a link there on the, my website to join my newsletter to keep abreast of all my books and what's coming out next. I will have the second book in this series um, all planned out and ready to go as soon as I finish up with this one. Also, I, I will be uh, writing the sequel to uh, Mexican Heat, which has been promised for a number of years now and uh, is just sitting there all outlined and ready to go. And that will be my next project. So uh, those two things, if you subscribe to my newsletter, you can keep up to date on how they're coming and when they'll be out. And Excellent. pretty much, I'm, a, I'm not that much of a social maverick, busy with the business and whatnot, but I do try to keep in touch with people who care. Great. Well, we'll, we'll link up to all those uh, points in the uh, show notes for this episode. Laura, we thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed the moment, Jeff. You can follow the GRL blog tour by going to gayromlit.com slash 2016 blog tour. So if you've been listening, you know that we've teamed up with the authors that we're hosting on the GRL tour for a huge giveaway. We are giving away a 7-inch fire tablet that's loaded with books from many of the authors that we're hosting. And in addition, they'll have books from myself as well as a package of books from Wild City Press from the authors that they're bringing to GRL. So, there's a raffle copter on episode 40's show notes where you can go and enter. We mentioned the word of the week earlier, mindset, which is part of what you need to know to plug in to get extra entries there. So, check that out. The other thing you'll find on the show notes is the poll that we started running last week because we want to know about you, our listener. Are you an author? Are you a reader? Are you an author who's also a reader? Or are you just listening to the show because you like to hear us talk? Go to the show notes, please, and pick one of those four to click it's a quick click, and then we'll have your answer so we kind of know who's out there listening to us. So we've been watching some movies. Why, yes. Some rather, yes, we have. Some rather unique movies mm -hmm. in some ways. So, yes, recently we saw two movies that we uh, think you guys might like. The first one we want to talk about is a horror comedy called You're Killing Me. And essentially, it is about this... Nar LA, narcissistic L.A. YouTube star who uh, meets this really nice, sweet guy with a slightly off-kilter off sense of humor. Mm. Uh, 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 the thing is, this guy that he meets is actually a serial killer. And uh, he's not joking. <laughs> all of his dark humor isn't a joke at all, but that's completely, you know... <laughs> This this one guy just totally doesn't get it. Oh my god! None, and none of the friends get it either until it's too late. <laughs> it's like you know he's not weird. He's hot because uh, he is. Um, the YouTube superstar, the oblivious YouTube star, is played by Jeffrey Self, who you might know from uh, a really funny show that aired on Logo for a while called Jeffrey and Cole's Jeffrey Jeffrey and Cole's Casserole. Yeah. Uh, and what's really funny, uh, Jeffrey Self is essentially playing himself mm -hmm. in uh, a movie that he wrote uh, <laughs> <laughs> as a, a, a comedian who makes you know short like sketch comedy YouTube clips. That's what he does for a living. 
Uh, and the he's cheating on Cole in this movie. Uh, <laughs> You're cheating on Cole, Jeffrey. We uh, don't know why. Anyway, the adorable earnest serial killer is played by Matthew McKellingen, uh, who you might recall from East Siders, mm -hmm. uh, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, Matthew is so adorable and so straightforwardly earnest. Uh, in his performance. I think both of them are actually really terrific uh, in, in what make this movie worth watching. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It's dark and disturbing. So um, if you're into black comedy, uh, you should probably check this movie yeah, out. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, the other movie we watched recently is called Those People. It came out last year. And... I enjoyed this. I, I'm not think. I don't think you were as crazy about this particular movie as I, I was. Can't decide. It, <laughs> I liked it, but the story was kind of dark and depressing to me a little bit. What but, What I found appealing about this is that I, it's sort of. Um, it harkened back to the glamorous dramas of the fifties. Let me explain. This particular movie called Those People is about um, rich, beautiful people in New York and their rich, beautiful people problems <laughs> and uh, uh, how uncomfortable and difficult their lives are despite being so beautiful and rich. Um, <laughs> the main, one of the main characters is Charlie. Uh, he's an artist. I think he's wrapping up his schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, he's working on his, on his... On his thesis project. On his thesis projects, and he's, like, painting portraits and stuff. His best friend in the whole world is a guy named Sebastian, and Sebastian is essentially a professional rich kid. <laughs> um, that's what he has done his whole life. Um, I think Sebastian um, both revels in his wealth but also tries to push it away because his father is um uh, uh essentially a bernie madoff type he yeah. uh, uh an investment guy who got caught uh and is now in jail uh uh sebastian's family is constantly in the news now and S sebastian is actually sort of a prisoner in his glamorous New York penthouse for most of this movie. He's trying to avoid the paparazzi and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, one night, while the rich, beautiful young people are out and about in New York City, they go into a bar, and Charlie runs into Tim, who's playing the piano at this kind of hole-in-the-wall bar, and they kind of flirt, and they hit it off. Uh, and then later... Uh, Charlie and his friends go to a ritzy uh, concert. Symphony sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and Tim is the guest artist at this uh, symphony performance. So it turns out Tim is not only devastatingly handsome and charming, he's also an extremely well-known concert pianist. So uh, the rest of the movie is sort of about the... It's essentially the three-way relationship mm -hmm. between uh, the weird codependent friendship of uh, Charlie and Sebastian and Charlie's uh, attempts to kind of be his own man and uh, explore this relationship with this charming, handsome pianist. And it doesn't necessarily end in a traditional uh, happy ending... I think what's satisfying about the ending for me is is that all three of those main characters that we just spoke about all finally make grown up adult decisions. So mm. so instead of being the spoiled beautiful rich people that they have been, they're kind of taking responsibility for their lives and they're moving forward in an adult way. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um and I, I, I like the movie. I mean, I stuck with it, and the story was good. I was just... I didn't like some of their choices uh, <laughs> that they made. It, you, for you, it reminded you of the of 50s. I was more looking at the 80s and... Oh, that, like, yeah, I and agree. And like Brett, Brett Easton Ellis novels. Uh, well, not as, you know, 
narcissistic, narcissistically not, gross. But. Not quite that, not to that degree. It reminded me a lot of Less Than Zero. Specifically that one, not like American Psycho or anything like that. But okay. Less Than Zero is kind of okay. where I veered into. Okay, I can kind of see that. Yeah. All right. So we highly recommend both these movies. Yes. You're Killing Me and Those People. Both of them are available for rental at most of your traditional outlets. We actually did it the old-fashioned way, and we rented the discs from Netflix. Yes. And in the show notes, we'll have uh, links to Amazon where you can buy DVDs or stream on Amazon Video. Yeah. Uh, so we had the great opportunity this week to talk to Scott Pomfret, who is the author of the second half A Gay American Football Story, as well as three other novels that have come out just this since the beginning of this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's get over to that interview. I'm thrilled to welcome Scott D. Pomfret to the podcast. Scott is the author of four books that have come out this year. The Second Half, A Gay American Football Story, The Hunger Man, Only Say the Word, and a collection of short stories called You Are the One. His past published works include Since My Last Confession, A Gay Catholic Memoir, The Romantics brand of gay romance novels, and The Q Guide to Wine and Cocktails. Scott considers himself lucky to be able to write from his tiny Boston apartment and even tinier Provincetown Beach Shack, which he shares with his partner of 15 years, Scott Whittier. So, welcome, Scott, to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. I appreciate you guys having me on. And I have to say that I'm a little jealous of your Provincetown Beach Shack. That sounds awesome. (laughs) It is. It certainly is this time of year, and my partner, Scott, is actually down there the whole summer, so I'm jealous as well, if that makes you feel better. (laughs) So tell us about your recent work, which is the one that I've read, uh, the second half, and the inspiration behind it. Sure. So the second half is a, uh, you know, the subtitle is a a gay American football story. It is a romance um, between a young college coach and his uh, slightly older uh, quarterback who has, is a military guy, had served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the story tells about the the difficulty the college coach has expressing his feelings. Indeed, it takes him two years to actually actually make an approach to the to the football star. Uh, but once they do dive in, uh, it's with both feet. But it's not a traditional romance. So this is above all a football story. Uh, you know, it is a sports book. Uh, it is also, it, at times, a war story um, because the quarterback, you know, recalls some of the times he served and how they affected him. And lastly, these are flawed characters. These are these are not, you know, knights in shining armor by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, it, they they have fits and starts um, before they have any chance of getting to happiness. Yeah, that was one of the things I liked about the book so much is that there's really a lot going on here. You've got that standard romantic element and the push and pull between these guys trying to get together. Uh, and the, one of the things I liked about it as a sports book is when it takes the the coach and the athlete, you've brought them much closer together in age because uh, the coach is the youngest of his type of coach in the league and the, the football star is older because of his military time. That's right. So it's not it's not kind of a, a daddy son role play sort of thing. It's not a traditional coach uh, element. You know, they are they are in some ways peers. Both of them uh, happen to be quarterbacks. Uh, they both happen to be very talented. The 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 coach actually sort of perhaps more talented and sort of flubbed his talent. Was not able to try and make it the next step to the to the pros. And the the uh, and Brady, the the soldier turned uh, football star, is much more of a scrappy, you know, not necessarily a native talent uh, on the field. Somebody who fights to get get where he wants to be. So in that way, the the, the two are are different, but they are also somewhat alike. What was your inspiration behind pulling all this together into the book? So. I, I wanted to, and this is sort of captured in the subtitle of the story, A Gay American Football Story, I wanted to make gay as American as football, as mom, as apple pie. 
you know, and obviously this was way before or Orlando, but in a post Orlando world, post pulse world, you know, I think that's a particularly important statement to make. I'm glad I made it. Um, and so I'm weaving in some elements that, that I, I think people think of as, you know, very American, you know, the, the sort of military piece of it, the sports piece of it. And, uh, above all, these two guys are, are not only trying to, you know, get together with, you know, their second half, so to speak, you know, the, the, their, their better half, um, but they are also trying to live up to the best conception of themselves. So there's, there's a lot in here about honor, not necessarily military honor, but about honor and truthfulness and being true to, your, to yourself and, and to the people that you interact with. I like how much you've not only have layered in the book, but in the title as well, because um, it it works as just the title, obviously. But now you now that you've told me all that too, it's like wow, there's a lot going on in just the title, which is yeah. And I think I think the second half also. I mean, obviously, second half of football game, but but the second half meaning a second chance. You know, that, that was another thing that I I just wanted to to, to sort of pull together in a, in three simple words. So I have to ask, which came first, the title or the or the story? Because it seems like it could have gone either way there. So, so you mentioned that back back in the day, uh, my partner and I used to write the romantics romance novels, and we we had we we published seven of them. We had uh, a few that were sort of sitting in outline format. This was one of those untitled, and I brushed it off. Um, now, now, probably three years ago, brushed it off, and uh, the the title I will admit came very, very early on, uh, and I was like, "Oh, that's perfect! Uh, let's go for it." Um, it kind of helped me, con- you know, finish the book uh, ultimately. Mm-hmm. And and certainly, even in this you know post Michael Sam era, it's certainly it's it's a timely book now as we get more athletes coming out too. Absolutely, and and you know I I, I mentioned Michael Sam uh, and a few other folks in the uh, dedication to the book, but I'm, but I'm also sort of appealing to the the, the much less uh, high profile people, so the people who who are who are athletes who are coming out in high school, who are coming out in college, and you've seen those stories, and they've only prolifer- proliferated after uh, after the Pulse situation. Um, you, you see more and more of those stories, and I, again, I think that's important uh, of, of the Americanizing of gay, not necessarily normalizing. You know, I, I, I think in some way we sort of still think of ourselves as, as uh, in some way exceptional, certainly different, um, but at the same time, that di- making that difference part of the uh, American story, and in particular for the American athlete. <laughs> Now, as I as I mentioned in the intro, you've had a very prolific year with now you know four books coming out. Uh, tell us about those other three because I haven't had sure. A chance to I read mean, those it, yet. appearances uh, can be deceiving because these actually these three were actually written over the course of time. So, uh, only say the word is a. Uh, is a, 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 sort of a, uh, a also an unusual romance. It is about a. Uh, old this time an older younger couple, uh, the younger of whom is involved in the Catholic Church during the time that that the church was in opposition to same sex marriage in Massachusetts. Not that they aren't now, but but now they're a lot quieter about it. Uh, and they um, eventually the 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 pitch of religious fervor around uh, same sex marriage ends up with the uh, with a shooting at the church that that involves the the younger partner of the two. And it's about the fallout from that. Um, you know, it, it, there is a, spirit, a, a major league spiritual element to it. I actually started writing it before I wrote the memoir you referenced since my last confession, put it aside, and then brought it out again um, last year and started working again on the, on the more fictional, um, spiritual, a uh, little bit more, you know, magic realism, for, any, for, for lack of a better word, built into it. Um, the short story, similarly... Uh, span over the years, so I think there's one that goes back as far as it was published back in 2001, um, and come right up to to uh, about six months before publication date. And they are eclectic, uh, but there are there is a theme. Uh, there's a military theme for one. Uh, many of them set in the "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" era, 
and there is a sort of a, a mini theme of second person narration. So, so about a third of them are are narrated in the second person, sort of the the, the you uh, uh, throughout. Uh, and the last book, I, 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 met, I posted this on Facebook the other day and, and got some grief for it, but the last book is, is actually my favorite. It is uh, The Hunger Man, and it is a historical novel with a, a central gay character uh, who happens to have been kidnapped by the Irish fairies when he was, when he was young. But it, it, it deals with the uh, famine that, uh, that afflicted Ireland in the 1840s and in the early 1850s that caused the massive Irish uh, diaspora uh, that populated America, Australia, you, know, you name it, all over the world. And it, this one is very much what I call fairy realism because it is based on Irish fairy tales, Irish myth sort of woven into the structure uh, of the history of that time, although I've been sort of loosey-goosey with the actual historical timeline, uh, of course, to make it fit the story. But, um, you know, that, that is, that is my, my, my actual favorite. I'm, I'm Irish by background. My mother uh, was, was born there. My, my entire extended family is there. So this is, this is the one for them. That that crosses a lot of genre. Uh, it does. I I keep I just mentioned to somebody the, the other day that I, I I think I have to keep rebuilding an audience for every single book I put out because they're all sort of very different from one another, um, and and you know there's there's always a bit of a backbone of of romance in in each of them somewhere along the line. But uh, they, you know they tend to be these a traditional romances. Having having written more traditional ones with my partner, they tend to be these you know super flawed characters, uh, not necessarily happy ever a- happily ever after um, things. So uh, I, I I write what what captures my fancy, and I you know I, I could probably be more strategic about it. But ultimately, you only have so many books inside you, and only so much time. And, and let's talk about the time a little bit. So you had a big gap from about 2012 to now, from what I see in my research, were you just writing on all these and they happen to come out now? So I was writing throughout that time. I was writing short stories and I continue to write short stories. I was publishing under a a different name so that my current employer would feel more comfortable about life in general. Um, they have since uh, come around, and hence you have this flurry of books all of a sudden coming out right now. Uh, and um, you know, it, it's kind of a backlog in many ways. Uh, and, I, and I do continue to publish the short stories in literary journals uh, throughout this time frame. That's cool. That's cool. I'm glad to know it didn't just stop completely. Um... I'm intrigued that you went second person, and I, I, I'm going to have to pick up that book because second person is often considered, you know, really a ballsy choice to make because it's not used that often. That's right. I think some people have difficulty uh, because it's a. It can be accusatory in many ways, and in many of my stories, you know, are 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 pointing the finger at 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 the recipient. In this case, that is the reader. Um, and I think people find it um, hard to to live in inside the story in that way, um, and they 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 struggle with it. I've always loved it because it's so good for voice. You know, if you can if you can keep a consistent voice throughout, it can be magical. Not well done, obviously. It 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 breaks down, and then it starts to sort of feel like a gimmick instead of instead of a legitimate you know narrative technique. Um, you know, I, I, I obviously also write in, in first and uh, third, but, but that is one of my favorites because I just find, find it has some sort of a, an ability to have a hard staccato sort of rhythm to it. You know, you, 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 um, that, I, that I really enjoy. But, but it's certainly not for every story, and it's definitely, so I hear, not for every reader. Just one more question on that. How do you decide... What makes that kind of story that you're like, this one needs to be second? Is there a particular something to it that sticks out for you? Uh, it, it's often driven by some sort of passion, um, not infrequently anger. Um, but, but, but you know, there's a, a story in You Are the One that, that's, that is a love story. It is a title story, You Are the One. Um, and, um, but it, but it's, a, it's a passionate, uh, frustrated, uh, um, you know, again, occasionally angry voice 
that seems to work really well in the second person in a way that in the first person maybe it would get it, it would get lost um, and be a, be a little more uh, discursive in a way that that gets rid of that staccato sort of rhythm that that I really wanted to have in the in that sort of story. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have a fanboy moment now. <laughs> so romantics, yay! <laughs> and we do have the other two too, but they don't, they're not the same size, so I couldn't hold them all up. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Wonderful to see them again. Uh, these five seem out of print. So, so the um, we actually in and I can't remember the year we actually changed uh, and started working with Lucid, uh, publisher of uh, a lot of male male romance uh, and erotica, and so they are actually all available with sadly different covers uh, at Lucid. Very nice covers, but. But 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 different. Um, those five are available. Um, they only as ebooks now. Um, so if people are interested in going out, it, it, it's it's at loose hyphen id id dot com, and uh, they're out there. You can search Lucid Romantics, okay. and you will you will find them. The other two, uh, Hot Sauce and Email, um, the original publishers still re- retain the rights to it, and so they are uh, you, you know they're still uh, available as paperbacks uh, as we speak. Yeah, I saw those on Amazon. I didn't see these on Amazon when I went to look. So yeah, I'll have the to... search doesn't seem to be working quite quite as well. But I do. If you if you go to my website scottpomfret.com, and there's a books page, there are links to each of them uh, on that page. Yeah, to the we'll link side. people up to those because these these are how we discovered you and Scott uh, back in the day, and and we love those. Well, we, we, I was glad glad to see and to see you guys doing this. I, I'm really interested that you you started the podcast and and it seems to be going wonderfully. So uh, I, I was curious myself. <laughs> Turn the tables for a second. What made you guys think about doing this? Um, for us, it was truly one day. It was like there's not a podcast that really sits in the gay romance genre. Um, and since we started it, we found a couple others. That are there's one called Rote that talks to a lot of, of gay authors, but also gay artists. They're like they're authors and painters and musicians and so forth. And then there's one called Romance Out Loud that also kind of deals in this space. Uh, and so we wanted to start something to talk about the books that we love, the books that we write um, as well. Um, and so we just kind of went for it. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, and it's great because we get to talk to authors who whose books and work we love um, and try to help use the platform to to get authors work further out, you know, and and from our side, it's also getting our own work mentioned, you know, routinely, because what at the top of the show, we always got to talk about what we're doing with our writing right now. So it's yeah, it's. It serves many purposes um, for us, and we, we have a great time doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful vehicle, you know, to, as an author, and I've seen see you have authors with, with – you've had at least one author from my new uh, publisher, Nine Star Press, on before. And, you know, that's terrific, especially for a fledgling press, to be able to have a platform uh, that's sort of mutually beneficial for, for, for all of us. Yeah, and it's, I admit we're a little curated because uh, for these longer form interviews like this one, we do, we want to read the book. We want to embrace and love the book um, to have the person, you know, on and, you know, have the dialogue. Yep. Makes, makes sense. Um, so is there, is there more from Scott and Scott on the horizons going back to romantics a little bit? Sure. There is not from Scott and Scott as such. Um, my partner, Scott, has just launched his freelance career, uh, taking all his years in advertising and, uh, you know, strategy and communications and so on. And, um, you know, going to to turn that into a career. So he's spending a lot of his creative and writing energy um, doing that. He also has some some other writing projects uh, in mind. He has my, my favorite is his uh, he has a an, an idea for a, a detective series with a sort of hot dumb detective that manages to sleep his way to the solution every every uh, episode. So uh, 
you know, we, we, he's got those going on. I have a bunch of projects that I'm continuing to work on. So, you know, we're, we're writing side by side, but not together anymore. Any tips for, for Will and I? Because we're, we're looking at starting to co-write uh, next year. Patience and be careful what you say about the other one's sex scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Get this big red mark in the, in the, in the, in the uh, margin that says not sexy. And then that's, a long discussion follows from that. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> so overall... What's your process for writing? Are you are you someone who outlines, or do you just kind of see where it goes, or what's your routine? It's interesting. Before Romantics, I used to be sort of the, the free floating, let the story take me where it goes sort of person, sort of writer. Um, Scott is way more outline focused, and I've moved much closer to him than I used to be. I still tend to sort of steal snippets um, of, of or images that I love from whatever I happen to be reading, whether it's poetry or whatever, and you know, dump those into a big document that, that's filled with these things, which I revisit. Sometimes I use them as the inspiration for stories. Uh, sometimes I use them in, you know, within the outline once I'm actually starting to crank through and, and fill in the chapters. Um, so, so that's been a change for me. I, I will say it makes me much more productive, even though I have this sort of fleeting sense that I'm, you know, killing the muse along the way. Um, it is, it is a be- I think it's a better, more disciplined process, ultimately. Who are your author influences? So it kind of changes every, uh, every book. I mean, I, I'm constantly reading. I try to, um, you know, always have something on me at all times. Uh, no matter where I happen to be. And, um, you know, for example, recently I read uh, books by Garth Greenwell and Adam Hazlitt, both, both gay writers, young, gay, youngish gay writers, young in the case of Garth, youngish in the case of uh, Adam. And, uh, you know, I, I, I loved in, in each of their cases, they, they, they sort of were painting in miniature, very, very elegant, uh, very, very small scope um, books, their most recent books. And, you know, not precisely for me. I like a little bit more scope, a little bit more uh, 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 breath over the years, etc. But, but the, the, the care and the attention to detail and to language was so beautiful. Um, you know, and that's the kind of inspiration that, that I take all the time as I'm, as I'm, you know, writing whatever it is I'm writing. I, I, I do obviously try to tie together what I'm writing with what I'm reading. So, so for example, you know, I read a lot of Irish poetry, mythology, etc. Well, well, history, obviously, while well, writing The Hunger Man, in part to get sort of what I think of as the rhythms of the land, um, the rhythms of the language. Um, but, um, you know, generally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being influenced by Shakespeare all the time. I'm being influenced kind of what I'm currently, what's currently on my TBR pile. And you, you mentioned, obviously, that you're, you're writing. What, what is coming next? What do we have to look forward to? So I'm, I'm looking at a, at a couple of sequels. Um, we do need to get our, 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 our football players, or at least one of them, into the NFL. So uh, Brady and Peyton uh, will, will continue to go forward and face some more struggles. And I, I think uh, Peyton may, I mean, excuse me, Brady may see some... Um, uh, fallout from some of the war stories he describes uh, in uh, in the second half. So there, there's a, a, at least one, maybe two of those still to come. And I'm also working on a sequel to The Hunger Man, uh, in which he, uh, the main character, the the, the gay fairy character, uh, uh, goes to New Orleans in the uh, 1850s and up through the start of the Civil War. So again, it'll be a a gay historical, uh, you know, filled with New Orleans magic, coupled with Irish magic. So uh, I'm looking, really looking forward to writing that one. Nice. I, I have to say, of course, that I'm super excited about sequels to the second half. Because <laughs> I was hoping there was more more Brady and Peyton in there somewhere, uh, whether it be that they yep, just became yep. supporting characters somewhere or continued to be at the front and center of the, of the story. Yeah, and I think there there may be a uh, gay flag football league uh, backdrop to to one of these sequels. So so there's there's material. 
the, the boys have a lot of uh, development to do. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to that and to, to you know having them come alive, uh, become a little more rich in, in each of these new settings. Awesome. So what's the best way for people to keep up with you online so they can find all this stuff when it comes out? Sure. I mean, my website is definitely the, the main place to go. It is scottpomfret.com, all one word. And uh, I'm also on Twitter at, at Boston Shanaki. So that's Boston, the city, and then S-E-A-N-A-C-H-I-E. And that word Shanaki is Irish for, for storyteller. Uh, so nice. uh, you can find, me, can find me there. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this was great. Uh, Jeff, it was absolutely a pleasure. So great to talk to you. And uh, please give my best to Will and hope you guys write up a storm. Um, you know, I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to chat and hope to do it again. Yeah. So we thank Scott for coming and hanging out with us for a while. Uh, I can't wait to read the other three books since I've only read the second half. Uh, there's links in the show notes to all the books on Amazon plus my review of the second half, which I did over on jeffandwill.com. Uh, to remind you, of course, we've got the big GRL giveaway going on on the show notes on episode 40, so check out the Rafflecopter for that. And don't forget to hit the poll while you're there so we can find out what kind of listener you are. Exactly. Now, coming up next week in episode number 41, we've got J. Scott Coatesworth, and he'll be here as part of the GRL blog tour. Plus, we have the creators of a really, really special uh, television show called Truth Slash Fiction, and I'll talk about the their uh, new comedy. Yes. They are in shopping around. Yes. So that'll do it for this week. Uh, have a good one. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. New episodes are available every Monday at iTunes and other major podcast outlets. While there, subscribe to the show and please consider leaving a review. For detailed show notes, links, and to sign up for the monthly newsletter, visit BigGayFictionPodcast.com. <laughs>